I'm Master Chief Mark Hakala. I spent 30 years in the Navy, but I've spent my whole life being intrigued by naval customs, traditions, history, heritage, and uniforms. So I'd like to share some of that enthusiasm with you using some items in my personal collection to get us started. Let's see what's in the sea chest today. One component of the Navy uniform that instantly marks somebody as being recognizable as a sailor is the jumper. Unlike other services whose uniforms usually consist of a shirt and a coat, the Navy has stayed with this functional pullover top with its famous square back collar from just before the Civil War up to the present, except for a few dark years in the 1970s. Over the decades, there's been lots of little changes to the jumper as far as its cut, its design, what's worn on it, and how it's worn. And seeing those changes really gives some good insight into the history of the Navy and where the sailors were at during that particular point in time. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few examples and see what we can find. The vast majority of the jumpers we'll see here are going to be blue, either service dress blue or blue dress, depending on the era. The name changed a little bit over time. But I have this really great example of a dress white jumper. Dress white jumpers first showed up in the sailor's sea bag just before the Civil War and remained a part of it until the very beginning of World War II when they were canceled. Now, they did come back for a select group of people, the Seaman Guard in Washington, just after World War II for a couple of years, but that was the end of it. What stands out immediately about this jumper is that it has the exact same collar and cuffs as the blue dress or service dress blue jumper. By the time of this particular jumper, the rows of piping on the collar had been standardized to three. Prior to that, they'd been used to indicate rank. The piping on the cuffs, however, would continue to do this all the way into World War II. So based on the blue seaman stripe on the right shoulder and the fact that there's three rows of piping down on the cuffs, we can see that this individual was a seaman first class. Something else that might stand out is the lanyard that you see around the neck. This was for the sailor's knife. Now, different periods of time, it was mandatory and other periods of time, it was optional. If you look at the neckerchief, you can see that the square knot is tied much, much lower than it would be today. If you look closely between the knot of the neckerchief and the notch in the jumper, you'll see an interesting patch. It's in the shape of a figure eight knot. This was the ex-apprentice mark. This said that the individual had passed through a formal apprenticeship training. This insignia was used for a long time, from 1886 all the way through 1948. Here we have a blue dress jumper of a hospital apprentice. Now, because of a couple of details on this, we can narrow it down to a specific time period. The Navy Hospital Corps was established June 17, 1898, but it didn't have a fully fleshed out rate structure. Unlike other ratings where you had non-rated personnel, third, second, and first class petty officers, and chief petty officers, the Hospital Corps initially only had three rates. Hospital Apprentice, which ranked with a uh, Seaman Second Class. Hospital Apprentice First Class, which was a Third Class Petty Officer. And Hospital Steward, which was a Chief Petty Officer. From 1898 to 1900, the Red Cross that was designated for the Hospital Apprentice had arms two inches long. In 1900, they were reduced to an inch. You see the Red Cross is on the right sleeve. Now, during this time, between 1900 and 1912, rating badges were worn on the sleeve of the jumper corresponding to your watch section. Left arm port section, right arm starboard section. The hospital apprentice mark was the first rating mark used for non-rated personnel, i.e. non-petty officers. Again, you see the two cuff stripes, which establish this sailor as being the equivalent of a seaman second class. And, as with the previous example, you see the knife lanyard. This example is from the World War I period. Several aspects are continuing on, such as the use of the seaman stripe at the right shoulder, and the use of cuff stripes 
to determine the various grades of non-rated personnel. Now this one's kind of unusual because if you notice on the left sleeve there is a service stripe or hash mark. So this individual, even though he hadn't gotten above semen, had been in for four years. Now one of the things you see introduced at the tail end of World War I is gold chevrons that are worn down on the lower part of the sleeve, on the forearm. These were used to recognize two different things. If they were worn on the left sleeve, they were war service chevrons or overseas chevrons. This meant that you served in Europe, you were underway in the Atlantic, or your ship was either shot at by the enemy or torpedoed. Except in the latter case, your tour of duty had to be at least three months. If you spent more than a year, you would get a second chevron. Now again, these are gold braid, actually gold bullion wire. That was the left sleeve. If you wore the chevron on the right sleeve, this meant that you had been wounded. You had to have received a wound as a result of action by the enemy that required treatment by a medical officer. This included being hit by poison gas. In 1932, then Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, General Douglas MacArthur, sought to bring back George Washington's purple patch that was issued to a soldier for merit. He brought it back as the Purple Heart Medal. For the next decade, the Purple Heart Medal was exclusively an Army award. In December of 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order making the Purple Heart Medal applicable to the sea services, to the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard. At this point, the Purple Heart replaced the wound chevron. As a quick aside, the sailor driving this ambulance in this photo died in September 1918 during the Spanish flu pandemic. This example from the World War II period is a fireman second class. Again, you notice the red fireman stripe at the left shoulder seam and the two cuff stripes. And you can also see the electrician's mate rating insignia featuring the geographical globe instead of the globe, i.e. light bulb that had been requested originally. What's kind of hard to see in this is that down at the waist of the jumper is a drawstring. From the 1850s all the way up till the end of World War II, the blue jumper was intended to be tied around the waist and tucked into the trousers and bloused over the top. This next one's unusual, but it requires a little background to be able to appreciate it. In the decades after World War I, the Navy reduced in size, both in ships and in number of personnel. In fact, through most of the 1920s and 30s, the total strength of the Navy was under 100,000 sailors. By the end of World War II in 1945, the strength of the Navy was 3.4 million. After World War I, the Navy had 350 or so ships. By the end of World War II, there were 6,700 ships in commission in the Navy. That's in commission with a commission pennant, a commanding officer. That does not include the myriad of amphibious craft, PT boats, and other things that did not have a commission. So in order to make such a dramatic increase in the size of the Navy to be able to fight a war around the world, there were whole new levels of infrastructure required. New technologies, new classes of ships that hadn't even been dreamt of were being created almost overnight. What this meant for the enlisted force was that whole new ratings had to be created, but there wasn't the time to do what you'd normally do when you created a new rating. You'd give it a fancy title, you'd come up with a symbol that would be worn between the eagle and the chevrons. So what the Navy did is created specialist ratings. The rating insignia for specialist ratings was a diamond and a particular letter, which indicated the specialty. For example, Specialist I was an IBM machine operator, computer operator. Specialist A was an athletic trainer. This example, Specialist M, between 1942 and 1944, was a mail clerk. In 
That later developed into the postal clerk rating. You might also notice that this jumper is a little bit different. This has an open cuff on the sleeves with no piping, and the collar is plain with no piping. This was called the undress blue jumper. Depending on what you were doing, undress blue was a daily working uniform. If you were doing really dirty work, you'd wear dungarees. Less dirty work, you'd wear this. Sort of the equivalent of the modern day Navy service uniform. This was normally worn without the neckerchief, except if you were performing specific duties such as watch standers. This next one is another great example. It's a gunner's mate second class, but with a couple of unusual insignia on the sleeves. First, you notice that the rating badge is worn on the right sleeve. Gunner's mate was a deck rating, so they wore it on the right. However, all enlisted sailors wore the service stripe or hash mark on the left sleeve. On the upper left sleeve is a patch depicting a sight picture. This was the insignia worn by somebody qualified as a gun pointer. A gun pointer directed the aim of the gun up and down, and the other half of the team, a gun trainer, directed the gun's aim left and right. This insignia was used from 1903 to 1970. Now, something far more interesting is on the lower right sleeve. Here you see a patch depicting submarine dolphins. When the submarine insignia was first created, only officers wore a metal pin on the chest. Enlisted submariners would wear the patch on the right forearm from 1924 until 1950 when a silver version of the pin was created. Here's another interesting one. This is an aviation machinist mate second class, and the insignia on his right arm identifies him as an air gunner. So in planes such as the SB-2C Helldiver bomber, the air gunner was the machine gunner who sat behind the pilot and faced aft. Some brief World War II humor. The way ratings were abbreviated during this time period, they always used a lowercase c for class. So BM1C would be Boson's mate first class. Because of the designation of the hell diver as SB2C, the sailors joked that it stood for son of a bitch second class. This insignia was used under various different names from 1943 until 1958. Another type of Navy plane during World War II that had an air gunner was the TBF Avenger. This was a torpedo bomber that had a pilot and a crew of two, a radio man and the turret gunner. This is the kind of aircraft that future president George H.W. Bush flew during World War II. This next one's great. It's a bosun's mate second class. He has one hash mark on his left sleeve. And at the top of the left sleeve is the PT boat patch. PT boats were wooden craft that were 77 to 80 feet, depending on the manufacturer. They were light, they had powerful engines, and could go 45 to 50 knots. They carried four Mark 8 torpedoes and twin 50 caliber machine guns. They were fast, agile, and could pack a mighty punch. This is what John F. Kennedy did during World War II. He commanded PT-109. Over on the right breast, you notice something a little bit unusual. It's a patch in the shape of a lozenge or diamond and depicts an eagle coming through a circle. Properly, this was termed the Honorable Service Lapel Button. Informally, World War II veterans referred to it as the ruptured duck. Now, this insignia served several purposes. First, it was proof that you were honorably discharged. Informally, it also came in handy for the operators of bus and train companies as they would see that it was a discharged military person who was on his way home and they'd give him free transportation. At this time, military enlisted personnel were not allowed to have civilian clothes in their possession. As a result, when they were discharged, they had to go home in uniform. Perhaps the most important function of the ruptured duck was to let shore patrol and military police know you were no longer in, you were out, you were discharged, and therefore if you got into trouble, you weren't their problem. 
During World War II, the Navy realized that they would need to create units of construction workers to be able to build landing strips, hospitals, all kinds of different things at forward bases as they progressed across the Pacific and into Europe. Formed and trained to fight as infantry, these personnel were organized into construction battalions, or CB. Initially, the insignia that they wore was the letters CB on the forearm of the uniform. In 1942, a civilian file clerk, Frank Iafredi, who was working on the base where CBs were being trained and formed, created this insignia, whimsically taking the letters CB and turning it into C as in S-E-A and B, B-E-E. -E. He portrayed it as a Navy B by putting on a white hat and several different ratings on the arms. He put a hammer and a wrench into two of the bee's arms to indicate that it was a construction bee. And he gave it a submachine gun to show that it was a fighting bee. This was worn on the left upper arm between 1944 and 1947, when all such patches were discontinued by the Navy. In other forms, this CB logo is used to this very day. Early in World War II, the Navy quickly realized that they were going to have to put a lot of soldiers and Marines ashore on different islands in the Pacific and on several beaches in Europe. As a result, the Navy faced the incredible task of having to come up with dozens of different classes of amphibious ships and amphibious landing craft. This was an element of the Navy that had never been dreamt of before. And thousands of these ships and craft were built and commissioned and put into service in almost no time whatsoever. In 1944, an amphibious force patch was created depicting an eagle, an anchor, and a Thompson submachine gun. You see this third class where's the amphibious force patch. But the thing that I love about this jumper is the Liberty Cuffs. Typically before the war, sailors who went to the Far East would have tailor-made blue dress uniforms made to wear on Liberty. These would typically include a zipper on one side of the body of the jumper, kind of like what we're going back to now. They'd often have silk lining with the wearer's name embroidered into the jumper. And then silk patches with beautiful embroidery of dragons or mermaids or similar things were sewn inside the cuffs of the jumper. Although not authorized, sailors would go out on liberty and they would turn up their cuffs so everybody could see the great embroidery work that they had. The last World War II example is this carpenter's mate. This rating would merge with several others, ultimately to become hull maintenance technician. Now there's not too much distinct about this particular jumper until you look at the rating badge. First, the feathers on the wings of the eagle are not perfectly symmetrical. This is typical of a pre-1941 rating badge. But then you also see that the top stripe and the two bottom ones are not the same. The top chevron has very tight stitching going around its periphery. This is very typical of the 1905 through 1940 rating badges. If you look beneath that, you see that a separate patch with two chevrons was sewn onto the bottom so that the individual didn't have to change out his entire rating badge. Over the years, particularly during World War II, various communities came up with unauthorized patches similar to the CB, similar to the PT boat, similar to the amphibious force, but which weren't authorized. The unauthorized insignia on the top of the sleeve of this bosun's mate second class's jumper is unique. I have never seen another one like it. The patch portrays a shark over the letters UDT, Underwater Demolition Teams. Created in 1942 and existing through 1983, Underwater Demolition Teams were the forerunners of today's SEALs. Because scuba diving played such an important part of their job, UDT sailors earned the nickname Frogmen. So typically, the patch that you would see for UDTs, not on uniforms, portrayed a tough-looking frog wearing a white hat and chomping on a cigar. So to see a shark portrayed on this patch is definitely unusual. 
Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.